But in the process of, of moving all of these lessons forward, um, I never lost track of that core mission. At Deloitte, I started Deloitte Research, which was intended to develop methodologies which, which would start with the methodology of total quality management and emerge that to higher productivity in workplace beyond just manufacturing. I started something in Chicago where I was living at the time called the Lincoln Foundation for uh, Business Excellence because I had become a Baldridge judge around total quality management and I thought I would use the platform of Deloitte to create an award to help organizations accelerate in adopting these new tools that the Japanese had adopted. So I continued to keep my mission focused and I felt really centered and, and authentic to what I was doing, even though I wasn't fully authentic to who I was um, along that journey. Now, I ultimately left Starwood and it gave me an opportunity to think what was next. Concurrently, somebody wrote uh, to me and said, Keith, I'm writing an article for Inc. Magazine. And it's about people who've had disproportionate success at a young age. I'd like to interview you. And I said, sure, but again, be thoughtful and be generous to people who could be important to you. I sat back and I spent hours thinking, what do I have to share with this journalist in advance? I didn't want to be lazy. And I walked in and I gave him 10 tips of how I was successful. And he looked at this, went back and talked to his editor. I didn't know this. He came back to me and said, you know what? Um, I don't want to interview you. We've decided we want the article to be you. You've just written it for us. They published the article in Inc. Magazine, 10 Tips of a Master Networker, which disgusted me. Um, but it provided an opportunity for a publisher to call me and say, Keith, you should write a book. And I said, I've just started a firm, Frazzy Greenlight. I don't know that I really have time to do this. We'll give you a quarter of a million. I will find time. <laughs> I wrote Never Read Alone, and it catapulted me into an entirely different place in the start of my company. Now, what was very interesting about this, and I'll just pause, remember the scarcity mindset, the fear, the insecurity, still there deeply. My earliest tools that I had in life to, to escape and to be a seeker were prayer. I was brought up in a strong religious background with my mom, and I believe very strongly in spirituality, and prayer was my place. But unfortunately, what I was praying for as a young man was, Please, God, take this away from me. And, and it was along the way that my, my secretum op finally opened up the opportunity. I wish I had found it earlier. But I approached a priest uh, in the Anglican church and asked a question about my sexuality, my shame. And he didn't greet me with shame. He gre greeted me with love. And then he encouraged me to see a therapist which I wish, you know, I had walked, I used to walk by the therapy place at Yale, wishing that I had the courage to walk in there at the time, all four years as I was going to class. Um, but it wasn't until afterward and it wasn't until I was a, a private individual that I could pay privately, even though I still had shame, my therapy. And then somebody mentioned this thing called meditation. And the idea was you could sit for 10 days and maybe discover something about yourself. It's called Vipassana. And it was one of the greatest door openings and gifts that I could ever possibly have in my life. And on day seven, I realized that I have everything that I need inside of myself. And it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had in my life. And I highly recommend it for anybody in this room. Um, now, with all of this going on, I started this firm. I now have this book. But what was interesting is I shunned the book. The book was about networking. I had made a commitment that I was going to reinvent American manufacturing, American industry. I was going to work with the titans of the largest corporations of the world and make sure that the preservation of the jobs in those organizations, the hundreds and thousands and the millions of people, would be, would be my contribution to the world. I didn't have time for a book about networking. 
I actually turned my back on it. So many of you in this room, I've already had the, the blessing of some of you coming up to me in the back of the room says, your book changed my life. And I didn't internalize that. Um, I was aiming at a different thing, and I couldn't think of the congruence of them at the time. Um, now, along the way, by the way, let me just give you a couple of tips here. The biggest thing I learned about building networks is that networking is exhausting. The, the kid who wrote Never Eat Alone was running around like a one-armed paper hanger, one-armed one paper hanger, wallpaper hanger, um, networking everywhere. And there's no question, if you read that book, you will smell scarcity. The tips are extraordinary. The practices are extraordinary. They, they, they allowed me to crush it in business and in life. But it's a lot. The elegance that I learned in retrospect looking back is there's a much more powerful way to network, and it's called building community. The simple path to that, and it's what Alex has done here, in anything that you want to achieve in this world, be the host of a beautiful community of other people who are looking to achieve it, and then that community will be your networkers. They will recruit more members, and they will allow individuals to come together, and I created a word for this, to co-elevate. Being the host of a co-elevating community is the most elegant, emotionally rich way to build the richness of the network that you need. Not to say that all of the things that I wrote about aren't valuable and important and useful, but the big takeaway in retrospect is each of you building a community, which by the way, in my research institute, which we formed, I took from the, the learnings of Deloitte Research, took those into Farazi Greenlight Research Institute. In our research institute, when the pandemic hit, I had recognized that this was a glorious opportunity to think about the reinvention of the future of work. I had been on that trail since 2010, and I had been studying hybrid work since 2010, funded by a couple million bucks from people like Accenture and Cisco and others. And all of a sudden, here we were with the most beautiful laboratory of the future of work. And I, and I decided to start a community of other people who were committed to never going back to work. We would only go forward to work. And it was the go forward to work research community. In that period of time, we published 30 or so articles in Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fortune, Fast Company, Inc., et cetera. We had hundreds and hundreds, thousands of individuals co-creating research and insights online. And that research institute has become one of the most beautiful things that I've been able and inspired to continue to lead and grow and, and looking to, to manifest even more and more and more.